What do you think about that Cardano price? <laughs> no, we're talking about Cardano networking today. Welcome back to Nerd Out, the show where we take a look at Cardano and we break it down, but we don't dumb it down. Today, we're taking a look at Cardano networking and the Cardano mini protocols. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So the first thing you need to know about Cardano networking is that it's based on the TCP IP stack. It does not use UDP or any lower level stuff. Um, the reason why we use TCP is we want guaranteed delivery between the nodes. Um, Cardano today uses unidirectional connections. So if, I, if my node connects out to someone else's node, it's only a one-way connection. If I need them to connect back to me, they have to initiate that connection. So each connection is either a client or it's a server, it's not both. And that's again today. So a node, a relay or a core needs both incoming and outgoing connections for proper functioning. If you just have like a sync node, like a, a database syncing node that you just want to follow along with the blockchain, that can be uh, just, just outgoing connections or like a, a dataless client could be just outgoing connections. There's one, um, one, one of the many protocols can go both well or goes the other way and that's the uh, transaction uh, protocol but we'll talk about that in a little bit um, all your connections are configured manually through a topology json file and that's going to be until p2p launches it'll be that way so next let's talk about the main protocol which is mux and mux just means it mixes them all together it's a multiplexing um, protocol this allows many, many protocols to run over a single TCP IP socket. And what the MUX protocol looks like, it starts off with um, 32, 32 bytes, or sorry, 32 bits of the transmission time, which is not currently really used. Um, then you have the 16 bits of the protocol ID. So that's how the receiver knows which protocol we're talking of the many, many protocols. And then next it has a payload length and then the payload bytes. And those payload length is again 16 bits, so two bytes. And the payload can be any length. There's a, a max length, I don't know what that is off the top of my head. So on the left down here, we're gonna take a look at some of the code. This is, um, this is the sender side. So we're gonna package that all up. We, we send our start time. That's the microseconds since the, the program started. It, it's not really used, but again, it, it's just something to let you line up if you have really close packets. They could uh, figure out the correct order on the server side if they needed to. Then we send, of course, the ID, that's 16. And then we send the payload length, that's again, 16 and then the entire payload we send. So on the receiving side, what this looks like is we, we read the bytes and we decode the timestamp. That's again, the first four bytes. And then we look at the next uh, two bytes. And you'll notice here, we're going to, um, we're going to strip off the, um, the hex value 8,000. And the reason for that is the the sending side does not have this um, this special uh, client byte, so it tells it whether it's the client side of the connection or the server side, and that's just this this flag here. So we're going to strip that off so that we can use the same um, protocol ID on both sides for comparison. And then we look up what protocol we're running. And then we go to that protocol and then we, we let that protocol receive the, the actual payload data and process that further. So what does this look like? So there's multiple different mini protocols running. We just looked at the, um, the handshake protocol. That one runs before any of these other mini protocols are spun up. So once the handshake completes, then um, then we spin up the other mini protocol. So we have chain sync. 
that syncs just the block headers. And that's all we need for something like CNCLI doing leader logs, is all we need is the block headers. Uh, block fetch, that'll retrieve the entire block, all the transactions, any metadata, everything is in this block fetch. And then transaction submission protocol, we'll talk about that in, in a little bit here. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into the Handshake mini protocol. So its ID is all zeros, that's kind of a reserved one. And we have what's called agency. Agency is who is holding the ball. So you can think about it as the client starts the connection. In this mini protocol, the client has agency to start. And we start at this uh, proposed step, or in the proposed state. And then the client sends this message proposed versions. And then, then we enter into server agency. So that's anything that's blue is server agency, anything that's green is client agency. So when we're in this state confirm, we're in server agency. And then it's the server's job to send back this message accept version if you know the client is connecting on the right network, you know, it's got the right network magic number, and we support the, the various protocol versions that the client has said they speak. Um, it may be that if something doesn't match, the server then sends back a message refuse. But no matter what, we always end up in this done state after the handshake mini protocol is done. So here's an example of what that kind of looks like in code. Um, some of the earlier versions, you'll notice that they just have, you send a version and then you send a network magic. And you package all that up into a CBOR encoded byte string. Uh, some of the more recent ones and there's, there's two beyond this now, but all they change is the internal node, um, the query protocol, um, not the node-to-node -node protocol. So I don't have those in here. But in some of the more recent ones, we have not only a network magic, but we have this Boolean value. And that's going to be used in the future to determine whether the connection is unidirectional or bidirectional. We'll talk about that at the end. So let's test a handshake manually. Since we know what the packet looks like, what if we just connect and send this packet to a server? So we're going to hit one of the IOHK relays, and we're just going to craft a packet. So if you look at the, the uh, hex here, we're sending kind of a dummy timestamp. We just set all threes for the timestamp. We have 0000, which is our protocol ID. We have 00 and then 09. That's the length of the packet we're encoding. And then the CBOR we're encoding is, um, in this case, we're just doing protocol version 3, uh, right here, 03. And so we've encoded the network magic then, firing that off with the netconnect com command. And then we're, we're parsing the response to give us the hex value. And then I've thrown it into CBOR.me website. That helps us decode it so you can kind of see it in more of a JSON format of what came back. And you'll notice it came back as an array of uh, one, which is the, the internal message ID within the protocol. So the protocol has an ID, but the individual messages have an ID too. And this is, uh, so one is message accept version. And then they're saying they're accepting version three, which is what I sent, and they're confirming the magic number. So that's what that looks like. And if you wanted to just create a little script to ping a relay to see if it's alive, this is something that you could do. Uh, so next, let's take a quick look at the chain sync mini protocol. This one starts out in state idle. And the first thing that we do here is we've got to figure out uh, where we are on the client versus where we are on the server to sync up. And to do that, we use this message find intersect. So we want to find out you know, which block we have in the client versus what they have available on the server and find a good spot to intersect. So we'll send a bunch of our blocks to them, or block headers to them. We'll say, hey, I've got you know this block, and then maybe we count back on the blockchain uh, two blocks, then we go back four blocks, eight blocks, 16 blocks, 32 blocks, and we say, here's all the blocks I've got. <clears throat> but again, we don't know if we're on a fork, so maybe we need the server. Um, it'll say, it'll give us a message intersect found and it'll send one of those blocks back to us. 
And so then we know, okay, that's where we're going to sync up is from that block forward. And at that point, then we start talking to the server and we say, request next. And then we'll be getting messages from the server that'll be usually message roll forward. So it kind of sits in this loop, request next, roll forward, request next, roll forward. Sometimes we'll get a roll backward, and that's if there's a slot battle or something, or we need to roll back if there's, if you know, we've ended up on a fork. And so the server will say, hey, you're on a fork, go back to this block instead. This is the last good block. And then you can just keep uh, rolling forward along the blockchain at that point. Now you could at any time... Um, jump forward or back. So if we're doing, for example, sending stuff to pool tool, maybe we don't care about rolling through every block. We just want to jump to the tip of the blockchain. So what we do is we do, you know, message find intersect, and then they'll say, you know, intersect not found, but they'll also send back our their tip with that. And so then we can say, you know, next I'll find another intersect, but give me the tip. And then we can start rolling forward right from the tip. We don't care about anything in the past. So it's it's a pretty flexible protocol. You can do a lot with it. So other mini protocols, we're not going to take the time to talk about them today, but there's a block fetch that retrieves the full blocks. If uh, you need to, to get the full block to get the nitty gritty of the what actually happened in transactions or metadata, um, there's a transaction submission and there's a transaction submission to protocol, which is newer, that flips the agency. Um, so in the earlier versions of the protocol, transaction submission one, the server actually started with agency. That was the only one that was different. So the server, immediately when you connect, it would say, do you have any transactions to submit to the client? And that made sense in the early days. Now, now it works a little differently. The reason is so all those mini protocols can start with the same agency. When we get to P2P, they all are going to have to start with the same agency. So they added an extra state and they, they flipped around the agency on that one. Uh, the other protocol is Keep Alive. This is just kind of to, you know, for routers and anything between you and the server, if there's not a block for a long period of time, you can send a Keep Alive just to say, hey, yeah, I'm still here. And then this will also be used in the future for determining P2P peer health. So doing measurements about how long, you know, what's the latency between me and this other peer. So let's talk about the future. So very soon in the next month or so, they're going to start rolling out peer to peer. The difference is this is now full duplex. So over a single TCP IP socket, we will run both copies, the client and the server copy of each of those mini protocols. Um, that's good and and uh, interesting for many reasons. One, you could have a core node entirely behind a firewall, completely, um, completely firewalled off, and all it has to do is connect out to your relay. You don't have to have that opening po open port on the incoming side if you don't want to. So that gives your core node a lot more protection. Um, there's also this concept of hot, cold, warm peers. So as the network adjusts it, adjusts, it will always end up in a state where you have the best connectivity, the best peers for your geolocation in the world. And you know, you'll know you be connected to a lot of those peers that are better at sending you blocks. So let's talk about Catalyst. Catalyst, there's a, a couple projects I want to highlight here. There's the Ouroboros Networking Live JS. This is um, a project from Cardano Scan, Ashish, and this is going to be implementing the networking protocols in JavaScript. And this is useful for a number of reasons. Uh, the main one is so many people can build neat, unique stuff on top of this. Um, they can build block explorers, they can build um, all kinds of other stuff if they don't want to rely on something heavyweight like DBSync. Uh, the other project I want to highlight is the uh, Cardano Rust SDK. I'm kind of a, a fan of Rust. They're going to be making some updates for Alonzo and smart contracts. And this is really the code that the exchanges are going to use when they update on their side. So this, this is a very important project to vote for. Uh, vote for this guy so the exchanges can get Alonzo. We can get Alonzo faster um, and make sure all the exchanges are there. Otherwise, we're going to end up at the end of it. These guys are going to be scrambling, 
and it's going to be like, oh, well, we're ready on the node for Alonzo, but we got to wait on these exchanges to upgrade. Voting for this project will make sure that that process goes smoothly. So check out the links in the description below. And um, with that, nerd out.